Hi and welcome to another of the DTA screencasts and in today's session we're looking at anatomy and physiology and principally looking at bones. So there is a certain amount of assumed knowledge from your GCSEs when you're transferring and moving up towards an A level and that would be the names of all of the bones. So these you need to have before you actually start your A level and also what the axial and appendicular skeletons are. We would expect you to have examples of bones from the axial and from the appendicular skeleton and be quite comfortable with the terminology. There's also the five functions of the skeleton, principally movement, protection, blood cell production, shape and support and mineral storage. So just in uh, a little bit more detail but relatively quickly we'll look at each one of these. So movement is with the help of the muscles and this always occurs at joints. This is where you have the articulation of two, jo uh, two bones at a joint. Protection. The cranium protects the brain, obviously, and you have the rib cage that protects the heart and the lungs. So these are usually made up of um, flat bones. <coughs> and uh, a good example of that would be the sternum. So we have blood cell production. This produces red and white blood cells, and they are created in our long bones. Also, minerals and salts are stored in these bones as well. Our skeleton is obviously there for shape and support. If we didn't have these bones for our flesh to hang on to, we would probably be a bit more jelly-like. And so, therefore, we, it gives us our shape. And lastly, we have calcium storage. So the calcium is the mineral that is essential for bone strength and density. 99% of the body's stores uh, are in your bones, so that's very, very important. And this can help avoid osteoporosis, which might be something you'll have heard of and we'll talk about slightly later on. So the areas where this takes place is usually the humerus, ribs and the femur. So uh, again, very quickly, shapes of the bones. There are different ones, so the long bones. You need to know what each one of these does and examples of long bones as well. Again, this is assumed that you know this already. So very quickly, long bones always act as levers and work with joints to create movement. And examples are written down there so you can pause the screencast, go back and have a look at these if you're not sure. Short bones, these ones are usually found in the hand and feet and these are for finer movements, quite an obvious thing when you think about it and they can absorb large impact and act as shock absorbers because of that. Flat bones, as we mentioned earlier, provide that large surface area which gives us our protection. Example I mentioned before was sternum, other ones are scapular and cranium. Another type of bone is the irregular. This would be a uh, part of the vertebral column or, or facial bones. That's obviously in our face. Now one that you might not have heard of, but hopefully you have, is this one here, a sesamoid bone. Now these are found in locations where tendons pass over a joint and they act to protect that tendon or to increase its mechanical efficiency. And an excellent example and I want you to try and remember is the patella or the kneecap. But um, from now on, we'll try and when we're referring to bones, we'll try and use the technical vocabulary that's uh, relevant. So patella, and we would say that that is a sesamoid bone. So what does all this have to do with sports and physical activity? Well, it, it's quite important. If we had a look at this image, would we think this is appropriate for this little baby to be doing weightlifting? Quite impressive, though. Or what about this young lad here? Clearly been down the gym. Or this lad here, even younger, but uh, definitely been doing some weight. So what's the problem with that? Why, why would some of those images potentially be shocking or contentious? Well, what the problem is, is how we develop and when we develop. Initially, when we start out, we have cartilage. We don't actually have our bones straight away, as I'm sure you know. And as we slowly grow up and move into adolescence, the bone uh, grows uh, and what's actually happening with that is the cartilage is becoming solidified. So as this occurs this, uh, the cartilage is laid down on top of each one of the long bones or the other bones and then slowly but surely it grows in length. So here we can see an adolescence bone 
but you can notice up here this is the, the last point or, or the origin of where our bones actually grow and that's called the cartilage growth plate so at this point here is usually considered to be relatively weak in adolescence because it's still cartilaginous as opposed to solid bone so if we're taking part in physical activity that's high in impact then usually when a break occurs it will be at this growth plate so it's very important that we don't take part in physical activity that is too strenuous on our bones until they've actually solidified which is in our late adolescence early 20s and then our bones become considerably stronger and that clip's not um, not running because that's no big shakes okay so how that actually occurs is how the the growth occurs is we have things called osteoclasts and osteoblasts now osteoblasts they lay down new fibers for our bones to grow and osteoclasts take away dead fibers what that the osteoclast taking away actually allows new ones to be laid down so it's like taking away well old debris and then replacing it with new foundations and this allows the bone to grow and become a lot lot stronger so in this picture here you can see that um, if we get a green stick fracture they're ordinarily just um, along the long bone somewhere but a lot of the time you'll find that you'll get fractures at the growth plate you'll probably think of an example where you've fallen and it usually be at the end of the wrist or the ankle that's actually injured and that's because the growth plate is the weakest point and here Salter and Harris fracture classifications there are different ones so type 1, 2 and 3 all the way up to 6 so because of this we know that they occur on a more regular basis so when we're thinking about the type of physical activity we should do you've got to bear in mind the age or the bone development of the person who's taking part in the physical activity so the question for the class would be what activities should you avoid relating to growth plate injuries and physical activity. So go back over the screencast, any parts you're not sure about, and then we will talk about this question during the session. Okay, thanks very much. Bye.